from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. The Permanent Council of the Organization of American States has approved the resolution on Venezuela amidst scenes of confusion and strong objections from several member states. The session presided over by the U.S. voted by 18 to 9 in favor of recognizing the representative of the opposition figure, Juan Guaido, as Venezuela's permanent envoy to the OAS. Mexico called it a pyrrhic victory and challenged the right of the Permanent Council to take such a decision. The adoption of this resolution is a pyrrhic victory for a certain group of countries, which will have no impact on the real situation, but could cause serious consequences for the OEA itself and its institutions. Among these is the following. This resolution adopted is contrary to this organization rules and to normal multilateral practice. Is the Permanent Council the appropriate body? Are 18 votes a sufficient threshold? There is a real risk of paralysis in the organization, with a real risk of a permanent questioning of this or that representative. Uruguay, Bolivia, Antigua, Bermuda, and Nicaragua also said the vote violated the OAS rules and put the future of the organization in danger. La República Oriental del Uruguay the Republic of Uruguay believes that the procedures used to adopt this resolution are not in line with the norms of this organization of American states. It considers that this permanent council does not have the power to make this sort of decision, and therefore it does not recognize its legal validity and will not be bound by its content. We would like to say that the present disastrous course of a simple majority prevailing over all other matters of major significance in this organization should end in the interests of the organization and in the interests of our hemisphere. We, for our part, will continue to keep the door open for, season, for reasoned and reasonable dialogue with all member states on all issues that beset our hemisphere in the hope that we can very quickly return this organization to consensus in decision making. And Venezuela has condemned the resolution passed at the OAS. The Foreign Minister Jorge Reaza posted an official communique which denounces the flagrant violation of international law by a group of U.S. satellite states when they recognize the political puppet nominated by Donald Trump. It says that Venezuela will not recognize any decision taken by the OAS with the participation of such a spurious emissary. Indigenous leaders in Colombia have denounced President Ivan Duque for not meeting with them after almost a month of protest. The National Indigenous Organization of Colombia, ONIC, said in a statement that Duque has ignored their demands and failed them by not attending the scheduled meeting in the Department of Cauca. The statement added that the social minga protests will continue. Tuesday marks 71 years since the assassination of Jorge Eliezer Gaitán in Colombia. Gaitán's death set off a great wave of violent protests across the country. The biggest of these was the Bogotazo, a 10-hour riot which left areas of Bogotá destroyed. Gaitán devoted his life to fighting for people's rights. He also condemned abuses suffered by campesinos at the hands of the elite. His death led to worsening violence and inequality across Colombia, which is still gripping the nation. And victim associations have commemorated the National Day of Memory and Solidarity with victims of the armed conflict. The Women and Victims Association paid tribute to two women who have been killed, kidnapped, or have suffered sexual violence. Other events were held around the country to honor the victims of the armed conflict. 
The United Nations High Commission for Refugees is a racing against time to evacuate detained asylum seekers who have been caught up in the fighting in Tripoli. Thousands of migrants trying to reach Europe are detained across Libya after being intercepted on the Mediterranean Sea. A representative of the refugee agency said clashes between the warring parties have occurred near some of the detention centers. Uh, here at Ein Zara Detention Center, uh, which has been caught in the middle of fighting for the past uh, number of days. And people here are very scared. And UNHCR is relocating the most vulnerable so that are gathering a departure facility in a safer zone. As I'm speaking, uh, I can hear there's a artillery fire going on, explosions, and we're trying to move as quickly as possible. And the UN-backed government of national court in Libya thwarted an attempt by Khalifa Haftar's forces to enter Tripoli. GNA forces were seen firing rockets and light ammunition against the LNA troops. Violence in and around Tripoli has caused the displacement of more than 2,800 people fleeing from the fights. Rasmus Jacobson from Tunisia joined us earlier to talk more about the current situation in Libya. There is a, a national conference hosted by the United Nations planned to start in five days' time. And it was expected that this conference should have constituted a breakthrough in the transition which has stalled for the past several years. And so Hafta, a lot of uh, in efforts has been, have been invested in making Hafta buy into this conference, including most prominently in a meeting in Abu Dhabi at the end of February, where it was widely reported that uh, an agreement had been made between him and uh, Fayez al Zaraj, who heads the government of National Accord, which is based in Tripoli and recognized as the legitimate government of Libya and by the international community. Thus, it was very surprising that Haftar decided to launch this military offensive on Tripoli before the conference. Jacobson also said that if the conflict prolongs, neighboring countries may be affected. The longer the, the conflict goes on, the more destabilizing it will be for all of their neighbors. And I mean, if the LNA is already deploying more troops to the northwest to try to gain new momentum, and there appears to be signs that this is reducing the LNA's ability to maintain stability in the other parts of Libya that they have already captured. For example, there was an Islamic State attack in central Libya earlier this morning, where the jihadist group has conducted several attacks over the past nine months. There have also been reports about new instability in the southwest, which the LNA captured earlier this year. So the more the LNA pulls forces to the northwest to gain new momentum there, the more it loosens its grip on the other parts of the country, which of course may destabilize their neighbors. The grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo have located the 129th grandchild, kidnapped and illegally giving up for adoption during the dictatorship. The granddaughter lives in Spain, but was found thanks to the genetic testing of samples provided by her biological father and brothers. The grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo have been fighting since 1977 to locate the children of their daughters who were detained and disappeared during the dictatorship that had begun in 1977. We don't know her. We haven't met her and she has only talked to our lawyers and to the members of the National Commission for the right to identity on their phone. We are very worried about her reaction, but I truly believe that they will be able to hug and be very happy to be able to meet each other. She will slowly get to know her family, her brothers and the people who look for her. Our correspondent Edgar Esteban has more on this. People are waiting excitedly here at the headquarters of the grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo, where it was announced at a press conference that the grandchild number 129 has been found. The parents and brothers of the woman are expected to arrive here. The woman herself is currently living in Spain, and this news has brought tremendous joy to her whole family. They've been fighting for her return for 43 years, a fight for justice and truth. That was Edgardo Esteban from Buenos Aires. And researchers in Uruguay have developed a software to help recover documents from the dictatorship. Victims and family members of those who disappeared helped in the process. The search for truth never ends. 
Researchers and professors working at the Universidad de la República in Uruguay have created a software to recover archives from the dictatorship. These documents are unreadable, but this program can help with its transcription. The software is called Luisa. With its help, we can rescue documents that are damaged and cannot be read. The program allows everyone to search the document by typing keywords. Our algorithms can help us filter that search and rescue the document. The transcriptions are organized in a database. The name of the software pays tribute to Luisa Cuesta, who died in November 2018, at the age of 98, without knowing what happened to her son, Nevio Melo. He disappeared in Argentina during the dictatorship. We are currently working on the first phase of the project that can allow us to identify and read all the archives. But this doesn't always work automatically. There are programs that can recognize characters or words, but most of the information in these documents was written by hand or pages are damaged and cannot be read. That is why we are inviting people to help us. The program allows users to access pictures with blocks of words and a blank page to transcribe what people can read. Then, experts use grammar rules to transcribe the documents and then they use the statistics to find out what is the keyword that was most used for searchers. I think this will allow us access to a lot of information that many people have been looking for. We'll also be able to interpret these documents, cross-check the information and confirm if certain information is true or not. We'll be able to learn about our own history. This software is part of a bigger project at the Universidad de la República that will help people access more than three million documents from the military and the archives of the former National Agency of Intelligence. To access the project, visit www.cruzar.uy and click on the tab that says Luisa. We'll be back very soon and stay with us. Welcome back. Journalists and members of the National Assembly in Ecuador are condemning threats and cyber attacks against them on social media. They say President Lenín Moreno and his interior minister have failed to take action. Our correspondent, Denise Herrera, explains. Assemblyman Ronnie Aliaga has presented documents that allegedly implicated the president and his family in crimes of corruption, perjury, and money laundering. Since then, the assemblyman has received numerous death threats on social media. It is a concern. What kind of country are we living in? The lives of politicians, journalists and assembly members are betrayed, and the government is not doing anything about it. That's why I blame President Lenin Moreno and his national security ministers, specifically Minister Maria Paula Romo. Popular broadcaster Fabricio Vela, who works at Radio Majestad in Quito, has also been the target of cyber attacks and harassment. It began after he interviewed former president Rafael Correa. When you share opinions, you become the target of attacks. It's happened to me before, but never to this extent. It's the first time that I've experienced this type of systematic attack. These imposters even create fake social media accounts pretending to be me. They've created a false negative impression of who I am as a person and about my career. Although reports have been made about these threats, the government has said nothing. Mr. Lenin Moreno, you who were once my teacher, please find it in your heart to see that we are not doing anything wrong. The people on the radio, they are only communicating, just doing their jobs. The scandal was first reported by the Ecuadorian digital outlet La Fuente in an article titled The Offshore Labyrinth of the Presidential Cycle. One of its journalists, Fernando Villavicencio, spoke out against online threats and attacks, against him and his colleague. He also pointed the finger of blame at the Moreno government for failing the act in the matter. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Ecuador. 
The UN Human Rights High Commissioner Michel Bachelet has signed an agreement with the President of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador. The Commission will provide advice to Mexico's National Guard, a newly instated security unit, on human rights matters. Bachelet said the UN needs to be present to combat forced disappearances and violence against women. On Monday, Bachelet and the government signed a similar agreement to give human rights advice to those investigating the disappearance of 43 students who went missing in Iguala City. The agreement that we signed today demonstrates the shared interest in placing human rights issues as a top priority for all national security forces. Students in Paraguay are complaining to the Ministry of Education about a lack of teachers affecting more than 2,000 schools and more than 40,000 students across the country. Members of the National High School Federation taught classes outside the ministry to show their concern. They say the government is violating their right to education with unacceptable excuses. After two months without classes, they believe the opportunity for dialogue is over and are calling on the Congress to intervene directly with the Education Minister Eduardo Peta. The Peruvian indigenous community of Fuera Bamba has opened the roads connecting the copper mine Las Bambas. The community will meet this Tuesday to discuss the agreement signed with the mining company, which offered a compensation for using their roads. The deal stopped for now the protest that started more than two weeks ago. The controversial unexplained wealth bill has been passed in the lower house of Trudad and Tobago's parliament. After several hours of deliberations, all 34 members voted in favor of the amended bill that seeks to probe people's unexplained wealth for the recovery of criminal property. The proposed law has no exemption for sitting members of government. Haitian President Jovenel Moïse has announced Jean-Michel Lapin as the country's new prime minister. Lapin had been acting as prime minister ever since the Chamber of Deputies voted in favor of removing Prime Minister Jean-Henri Sant last month. He was one of the three candidates proposed by leaders of the parliament. Haiti has been going through a series of political and social crises since February 2019 with vast protests engulfing cities across the country. Prime Minister Mia Mali has called on Barbadians living abroad to redefine the concept of diaspora. Motley made the call while participating in a town hall meeting in Canada. That I need you to be active citizens of your country. That you may not be on a rock of 166 square miles. But we've already learned that that 166 square miles does not constitute Barbados. The Douglas Charles Airport in Dominica remains closed as investigators continue their probe into the crash landing of an aircraft on Monday. The Eastern Caribbean Civil Aviation Authority is spearheading the investigation. The aircraft's landing gear had reportedly collapsed soon after a touchdown on the runway. All 32 people on board escaped with only injuries. Normal operations are expected to resume soon at the airport once the Aviation Authority gives the all clear. The Cuban Baseball Federation is condemning the decision by U.S. President Donald Trump to block the historic agreement between Major League Baseball and the Cuban Baseball Federation. Trump's move essentially overturns an agreement that would have allowed Cuban players to sign with U.S. teams without needing to defect. In a statement, Cuba's Baseball Federation strongly rejects the move while suggesting that it was politically motivated. I think sports have nothing to do with politics. This is the biggest mistake that the leaders of any nation in the world make. They confuse politics with sports, which is a very necessary thing for the entertainment of a nation. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Martin Fayulu's Lamuka coalition has won the delayed legislative polls in the country's eastern region. The polls were originally scheduled for December 30th, but were postponed due to an Ebola epidemic and violence in the region. Results released by the Electoral Commission show that Fayulu's party won 10 seats, while incumbent President Felix Shisekedi's party won just one. Algeria's interim president, Abdel Lakader Ben Salah, has pledged to hold new elections within the next 90 days in accordance with the country's constitution. We are obliged to compete, citizens, the political class and the state institutions, as we speak, must work to ensure the conditions, all conditions, are right for a transparent and regular presidential poll which we will be all the guarantors, a poll that allows our people to make their free and sovereign choice. But earlier, thousands of protesters marched through the streets of Algeria to reject the newly appointed interim president. They say Ben Salah is part of a ruling caste that has dominated Algeria since its independence. Former President Abdelaziz Bouteflika resigned after nationwide protests put an end to his decades-long rule. The demonstrators want the entire government to resign without opposition. We are here today for the demands of the people. Let the people come out victorious. That is all. We are here so the ones who are governing the country live, because they are robbing and not building the country. They are destroying it. The Israeli Election Committee has begun counting votes after polls closed for the legislative elections. Exit polls are showing a tight race between incumbent Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party and his main rival Benny Gantz of the Blue and White Party. Both Netanyahu and Gantz are claiming a victory. However, Gantz's party has managed to win more seats in the country's parliament, with 37 seats against Likud's 33 seats. Official results are expected to be announced on Wednesday. Over 90 social organizations in Spain are calling for the boycott of far-right party Vox. Feminists, LGBTI and migrants, among other organizations, are urging for the country to not return to its darkest era. The rise of the far-right in Spain continues to raise concerns among minorities as well as with activists who work to defend history from being rewritten. We need to establish barriers so that political parties which condoned the 1936 coup and the dictatorship that followed with all its crimes are not able to either apply certain policies or honor war criminals from the Franco regime as if they were heroes. Feminist movements have also been a target for the far right. For that reason, they are sending a message to all women. Say no to fear, because a woman who's scared, she stops existing. LGTBI groups say they won't allow Spain to become a hostile land for them once again. We won't allow for the rights and freedoms we want to be questioned. We will not allow a single step back, and we will also demand that our politicians keep working for real equality. Migrants are also calling for equality and not to be used as a weapon during the electoral process. We are not political tools to be used by anyone. We don't accept for our name to be used in any political speech, especially when their goal is to worsen our situation, which is already very serious. These organizations are asking people to not vote for the Vox Far Right Party during the upcoming elections on April 28th, but they also ask that the parties which already reach an agreement with Vox in Andalusia also be ignored as they will probably ally with Vox at the national level. If you give your hand to the far right, you're saying that you think like them, that you think what they say is not wrong. The far right will never match with democracy. These movements gather outside Congress to raise their voices, as they believe that staying silent is a show of complicity. They say that when facing the far right, not a single step can be taken backwards. A group of researchers in Florence have proven that Leonardo da Vinci was ambidextrous. Researchers of the UFC gallery have confirmed what was suspected for a long time, that the Renaissance genius was able to write, draw and paint with both hands. For that, they analyzed Leonardo's earliest work, a landscape that dates back to 1473. 
According to the researchers, Da Vinci was born left-handed, but was re-educated to use his right hand. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.